I, uh, selective mutism is a condition where a person will find it difficult to speak in certain situations. For example, you may be able to speak to your parents or to familiar people such as friends and family, but you may find it very hard to speak outside of those familiar groups. It's as though you freeze up and even though you have something to say, there's stuff on your mind that you could say, you want to speak, but the words don't come out, you, you freeze. A lot of people will tell you, they think you're, you're awfully quiet, why don't you say something? Or maybe you're just very shy. Uh, other people will think that you're not interested in being friends with them, that you don't want to um, get socially acquainted with them as, oh, you're just a cold person, or maybe you're just uh, an arrogant person, you think you're too good for the people you're, you're around with. Um, Usually selective mutism is limited to one's childhood. It starts usually in the childhood, but is also resolved by the end of the childhood. However, it does happen sometimes to people where a sort of selective mutism uh, continues on into your adult life. Adult selective mutism is very rare and it is a very painful, frustrating condition. I myself believe that I may have had this type of condition into my adulthood. And that is because I was able to speak only uh, spontaneously and openly among, say, family members and, for example, familiar faces. If I had befriended people and I had been around them often, then I could finally start to open up more to them and speak to them uh, without reservations. Whereas if too many people would be around me that I just met or um, wasn't sure of who they were, for example, then all of a sudden I could freeze up. I was always able to speak to people face to face, one on one, but in a group setting, I would be uh, very reserved, very reticent. I wouldn't normally give people my thoughts just like that. I would have to first acquaint myself with these people and become familiar with them. And then maybe I could open up in a group setting with only those familiar people. Other people can have uh, this condition in a far worse degree where they simply can only speak to one or two familiar people and they cannot speak outside of these people at all to anybody. I'm making this series of videos as part of a, a series of people who have suffered uh, narcissistic abuse, specifically being raised by narcissists, meaning having suffered the abuse from narcissistic parents. I believe that selective mutism in some way or form may be related to what I perceive as uh, developing an avoidant attachment style to one's abusive parents. Avoidant attachment basically means uh, you learn as a child that there isn't that much of a point to approach your caregivers or your parents in this case uh, because you will always be hurt by them. You will be rejected by them. You will be put down by them, verbally abused, psychologically and neglected and so on and so forth. You learn very quickly that you may be hungry or you may be in need of somebody to hold you or hug you and you learn that your parents or care caregivers are not available to you and will rather hurt you. And you, in order to avoid the pain and the humiliation, you learn to shy away. I believe from this avoidant attachment style also comes avoidant communication. For example, if you give your thoughts to your parents, to your abusive parents, and, they, and you are always invalidated, your thoughts are always uh, you're always told that your thoughts are not so, you're wrong, or what you're doing is dangerous. Basically, your mind, your personality, your thoughts, your beliefs are invalidated in a consistent manner so that you learn there's no point in giving people your thoughts. Now, why do I think this all relates back to selective mutism? I think selective mutism may originate from this condition that you are, you've been put down for your thoughts so often, so frequently, that you learn there's no purpose into giving people your thoughts. Now something strange happens is that 
namely that people who suffer selective mutism into adulthood may still be able to communicate with the very abusers who used to put them down as a child. And I think the reason is as follows, is that as a person who suffers selective mutism in adulthood, you are still waiting for that first affirmation of your psychology, for that first validation of your personality that you never got as a child. So you can talk to the very people who used to abuse you, used to be the ones who put you down, and you talk to them hoping to finally still get that validation, the external validation from them to validate your heart, your mind, your soul, your thoughts, your beliefs, your convictions, and so on and so forth. But if your parents are, for example, narcissists, then that validation will never come. And so you remain stuck in this selective mutist condition where you have a hard time speaking up for yourself outdoors, you have a hard time speaking to unfamiliar faces, uh, but you can speak to the very people who cause you to have that condition. So what I think happens, what is possible here, and now, mind you, my disclaimer for my videos is always the same, it is that I am not a psychologist, I am rather a sort of witness who provides a first-hand account about certain conditions that I have experienced. So, but I am also allowed to give you my thoughts about these matters. And I believe that suffering narcissistic abuse, specifically when you were the scapegoat child, always put down for everything, blamed for everything you didn't do, basically blamed for all of your parents' problems, that you internalize this belief, you internalize the invalidation of your thoughts and your minds and your, and your beliefs, and so you become also this person who has trouble speaking up for themselves outside of the household that you grew up in. You develop, in other words, selective mutism. Now, I'm not aware of what the true origins of selective mutism are, because oftentimes in the literature about selective mutism, since it happens and starts in uh, childhood, it's very easy to blame the child. Oh, you're just born that way. This, this is your problem, right? But this isn't quite true because children who develop selective mutism used to be able to speak just fine, at, except until a certain age, from a certain age, they f start freezing up in situations. And that, that gives me the suggestion or the hint that it comes from abuse that those children suffer later in life. Normally children will grow out of this condition and they become very talkative uh, regardless of the selective mutist condition they used to suffer. If you have this selective mutism condition in combination with our narcissistic parents who may have always invalidated you and put you down, I believe it's quite possible for you that you are trapped and that for you the only way to escape your selective mutism is to begin to see your parents for what they are, abusive narcissists who will always put you down. I'll give you an example of how narcissistic people can uh, invalidate you and your personality and your thoughts. When I became an adult, I started having a desire to travel, probably to get away from my abusive parents and to have other experiences abroad, for example. Uh, if I would, for example, bring up the idea that I might want to travel to Italy to see the Vesuvius, the volcano, my parents' immediate response would be, that it's dangerous there, don't go there, there's a lot of crime there. They would, in other words, represent the world to me as a very dangerous place where you shouldn't travel to. Mind you, this is a form of val invalidation and so it is a form of psychological abuse. If you would always tell people that every idea they have to do something, that they shouldn't do it, and uh, it's dangerous, it's always dangerous, it's always a problem, there's always some kind of issue coming up to, as an excuse to tell the person, oh, you, I, if I were you, I wouldn't do it. If you speak to people like that consistently, that's a form of abuse. You are invalidating them. You're saying that there's nothing you can think of that I would ever agree to doing, or there's nothing you can think of that I would ever do. There's nothing you can think of that I think is safe it's always dangerous, it's always a problem. That's abuse. Uh, and through this kind of in invalidation, if you internalize this invalidation, you start to believe that there is nothing you can think of of doing that is right for you or that is good for you, such as traveling to see the Vesuvius. By extension, uh, if you are put down for the words that you speak, 
For example, when I was a small child, my father would scream at me that I'm not allowed to make those sounds coming from my mouth. He would then often tell me that I should go play in the garage where he could neither hear nor see me. I didn't know as a child that my father was a narcissistic alcoholic who, did, who just didn't care about his children. He didn't want to see or hear his children. He, he, he felt he was better off without us, right? Uh, I didn't know that as a child. I thought that I was just there was something wrong with me speaking up. There was something wrong with me making sounds. And I remember when I was around five or six years old, I was playing with my toy cars on the carpet, mind you, because I knew that sounds would upset my father. And I was still making, you know, the childish sounds of like, wee woo wee woo or like, right? The, child, the, the sort of sounds you make when you're a boy playing with cars, little toy cars, right? So my father came up to me, he towered over me, I was on the floor, playing, right? So he towered over me and he screamed that at me, like, I'm not allowed to make those sounds coming from my mouth. I remember internalizing that message and literally closing my mouth like that and thinking, in order for me to be a good boy, I have to be silent. I may not speak anymore. And I think what happened is that throughout the years that followed, I kept adhering to this internalized message of, I must not speak. I would have my mouth closed in school, for example. I would never speak up. I would never ask the teacher a question. I would really only uh, respond to people if I really had to, for example, for example, at the supermarket, you would go past the, uh, the checkout lady, or maybe nowadays it's a checkout guy, whatever it is, the checkout ladies, uh, I would not have conversations with them like normal people. Those like, hey, how are you doing? How's your day been? You know, I wouldn't talk like that. I would simply be quiet, say nothing at all. And I would only utter the words like, okay, yes, yeah, sure, here's the money, uh, cash or card, card. I would only respond in this minimalist manner to minimize my communication because unconsciously, I had still internalized that childhood message of my drunk alcoholic a uh, narcissistic father who didn't want to see or hear me tell me that I should not make any sounds coming from my mouth. I believe this is what kickstarted my selective mutism, which I carried over into my adulthood. I simply couldn't speak spontaneously to people in the outside world unless they were familiar people I had seen many times before or, or ones I had met in a social setting. I could speak to people, as I told you, one-on-one, -on -one, face to face, and in group settings only if I knew the people reasonably well. It took me an impossibly long time, you know, the majority, like the largest part of my life to date, to even become aware of this. I didn't know what selective mutism was. People maybe thought I was shy. Maybe people thought I was arrogant that I didn't like to speak to them. Um, no one told me that, hey, maybe there's this condition called selective mutism. Maybe you have it since you have trouble speaking to people in group settings, right? No one told me this. No one could tell me this. I didn't know this even existed. I didn't even know. I thought I thought I was shy. This isn't true because I remember now that before this started, I was actually a very outspoken, extroverted, verbally happy little fellow, right? Who was shut up by his narcissistic uh, bully of a father. It's my father's message that made me keep quiet for so long. It really ruined my life. If you cannot speak spontaneously to people, you're going to miss out on relations and love. You're going to miss out on better friendships. You're going to miss out on a massive chunk of social life that would have been important to you for your development as a human being. I was robbed of these things right? because uh, nobody could help me. Nobody could even explain this to me that this even is a condition at all. Uh, people, like I said, assumed, oh, that's just who you are. Oh, he just doesn't like to talk. Oh, he's just quiet. Oh, or he's just shy. Or, or maybe he's afraid of people or something like they, they will come up with excuses to put you in that box or that's just how you are and absolutely no one could ever explain it to you. It is only through my own effort uh, in my late 30s, mid to late 30s, that I began reading so many books in psychology, uh, many, like hundreds, like I've read over a thousand books nowadays, 
I mean, I've read over a thousand books and I'm sure uh, it must have been a hundred or two hundred of those involving psychology. So, like I said, I'm not a psychologist, but I obviously know a lot about it. And it is only through that effort of self-study that I began to see the things that affected me and the things that I, the problems I have in order to solve them later. In fact, just a year ago, I discovered TikTok and I started just speaking my mind on that app and getting a lot of traction at first. Like, you know, some, some videos go viral, they have like 50,000 views or 50,000 likes or so. And this was a very healthy experience for me to know that I can just speak my mind and there are some nasty commenters, maybe 2% of the people who respond are negative, they invalidate you. Most people just like what you say anyway. And, uh, and of the commenters, I'd say definitely up to 80% of the commenters give you a, a sort of positive comment. They, that means there was never a real reason for me to fear uh, speaking out in public. Mind you, people who suffer selective mutism, they don't necessarily fear speaking. They probably more likely fear the consequences of speaking. Meaning, in my case, when I made noises as a child, my aggressive alcoholic father, verbally aggressive father, he was not physically aggressive, but the verbally aggressive father would yell at me and shut me down, telling me to stop making those sounds coming from my mouth and to play in the garage or, or to play uh, outside. I remember even that when I was a teenager, uh, I quickly obviously learned to listen to music with my headphones on. Uh, I would also want to play music on the on our keyboard, our synthesizer that we had. And basically, we had musical instruments, even though our father couldn't stand hearing any noises. So I used the synthesizer with the so I used the synthesizer with headphones on, but then still, of course, my fingers touching the keys would make too much noise. And so I moved the synthesizer into my bedroom, further away from from the staircase, so that our father downstairs couldn't hear it. All right. Uh, so I basically remember retreating more and more into myself. I became more and more introverted, even though I was born an extrovert. Now, this whole phenomenon is what I call suppressed extroversion, where you are an extrovert. I am an extrovert. That's why I'm making these videos now. I'm expressing myself. I enjoy doing this. Yeah? This energizes me, speaking to the camera, giving me the opportunity to speak my mind to people. Right, energizes me. It makes me feel good afterwards. I am an extrovert, right? And I rediscovered my extrovert itself through this process of unwinding the selective mutism that I believe was kickstarted by my narcissistic abusive father. I don't have to listen to his message anymore that uh, I may not make any sounds with my mouth, so to speak. And in fact, I don't have to listen to anybody who is negative or critical of me, who wants to invalidate my words or thoughts. I don't have to listen to you, right? And I will, will not allow your negative comments to affect me any longer because I have overcome my condition. And I will continue to grow now as a speaker because I've always had this desire to speak, obviously. I'm going to continue to go down this path and be a successful speaker one day who will influence many people around the world.